There's a lot to think about with Hashimoto's. And with the amount of information on the internet, the overwhelm can be real. And although each person with Hashimoto's will require a certain degree of nuance, there are foundational things that can be done to help you start feeling better and start moving in the right direction. So that's why for today's video, I've compiled a list of my best and most favorite strategies that are likely to give you the greatest impact when you're starting out on your Hashimoto's journey. Hey guys, my name is Dr. Brad Bodel, and my practice specializes in using natural strategies like nutrition, lifestyle changes, and supplementation to help people improve their Hashimoto's and hypothyroid symptoms. By using a comprehensive system that treats your body as a whole and you as an individual person, I believe that no matter the chronicity and severity of your disease, you can get better. In addition to being in full-time practice, I make these videos every Thursday for you to help provide information and understanding. That way you can start making changes on your own and living the life that you deserve. If you've been enjoying the content, please remember to like, subscribe, and click on the bell. It really does help a lot. But before we dive into these strategies and tips, there are a few things that I wanna note. These recommendations are made with the assumption that your diagnosis of Hashimoto's is both clear and correct. Your labs have shown positive TPO antibodies, TG antibodies, or both, and your symptoms are presenting in a pattern of either low thyroid symptoms or alternating hypo and hyperthyroid symptoms, both of which can be associated with Hashimoto's. You've also been screened for other thyroid issues, and there's no evidence of thyroid cancer or Graves' disease. Finally, if your labs and symptoms dictate that you need medication, then you've already been working with your doctor to get the right kind of dose and type of medication for your body. However, with all of this other stuff already in place, many people continue to suffer. And the reason for that is because most of the time with autoimmunity, many practitioners fail to explain to their patients that if we wanna see improvements in how we feel and how we function, we have to reduce triggers to our system, we have to support the way that our immune system works, and we have to reduce inflammation. Without doing so, even if we have enough thyroid hormone present in the system, our body is going to struggle to use it. And that's where today's strategies come into play. So with our first recommendation, we're gonna start off with a bang as this change will likely have the biggest impact on your health and help you to start feeling better sooner. And it is going grain and dairy free. Why is this important? We know that there are proteins within gluten and dairy that have similar amino acid sequences to the proteins in our thyroid. This means that when we are exposed to these food proteins, we are more likely to have an inflammatory immune response both at the location of our gut and our thyroid. With the removal of these food proteins from our nutrition, it will reduce a specific immune trigger that will allow us to manage our inflammation and help our thyroid to function more normally. But as some of you may have noticed, I said grain-free, not just gluten-free, which is the typical recommendation. Wheat, barley, and rye contain gluten, and although there are a number of grains that don't have gluten in them, I think it's best to avoid these as well especially in the beginning. And although these might be a better choice for you down the line, there's a few things that you'll wanna consider. Although these other grains are gluten-free, they do contain proteins that have a similar structure to gluten and can therefore cause similar reactions. Sometimes when you introduce a novel food as a replacement for a previous standard, you can develop sensitivities to that food as well, especially if your gut is highly inflamed. And lastly, grains tend to be highly glycemic no matter the kinds of proteins within that grain, which means that they can elevate your blood sugar. This is something that can be problematic for a lot of people due to the fact that we can have changes in insulin function that often run in tandem with thyroid dysfunction. So just like it might be helpful for you to cut back on sugar, cutting back on grains can be supportive in a similar way. Now, of course, there can be a lot of other food changes that we need to make and many people with Hashimoto's have multiple food sensitivities. So continue to track and adapt your diet as needed. But again, if you're just getting started, going grain and dairy free can be a massive first step. Strategy number two is implementing light exercise. Now when it comes to Hashimoto's and exercise, it's always a balancing act. Exercise has the potential to be highly anti-inflammatory and immunoregulatory, but if we do too much, 
it can start to tear our body down. I see a lot of people on both ends of the spectrum where they're either not doing anything because they're so fatigued and in chronic pain, or they're trying so hard to lose weight that they're exercising as much as possible. And neither of these scenarios are very helpful. In the beginning, the best thing that you can do is consistent daily movement that is short in duration and two tolerance. And when I say two tolerance, what I mean is that after you exercise, you don't have an increase in symptoms and you feel better. For some people, that might be a five minute walk around the block and that's okay. And for others, it could be 30 minutes of weights and core exercises. As long as you pick something that you enjoy doing and you're being mindful of your symptoms, then that's a great place to be. And to those of you who've been asking, yes, you can do intense weight training with Hashimoto's if that's what you want. And again, if your body tolerates it, but if you're feeling exhausted afterwards, it's taking you a week to recover, and you're noticing worsening body pain, then it might be something that you need to work back up to. So with Hashimoto's, exercise is key to support your immune system. So if you're doing nothing, you need to become more active. And if you're doing too much, you need to rein it back in. Strategy number three is supporting your gut health with the use of apple cider vinegar. Now, just like with our nutrition, there's a lot of nuance when it comes to supporting our gut and supporting digestion. And apple cider vinegar isn't for everyone, but here's why it might be helpful for you. When it comes to the digestive process, many of the steps in the pathway are keyed off of having an appropriate acidic signal from our stomach. Without that acid and low pH, we don't start the digestive process very well, we don't signal to our gallbladder and pancreas, and we can have changes in motility. Not to mention the fact that low stomach acid can cause increased likelihood of food reactions and gut infections. So if we can start this process off right, and apple cider vinegar can help us to do so, then no matter what area we're struggling with, supporting better signaling from our stomach can have a cascading effect which can address different needs for different people. To put this into practice, I recommend taking one tablespoon of apple cider vinegar and mixing it with about six to eight ounces of water. I like to mix mine with sparkling water, but you don't have to. Then you'll wanna drink it about five to 10 minutes before your first meal, which can be enough for some people. However, if you're having a lot of gut and digestive issues, including it before each meal throughout the day might be necessary. If you notice any burning or discomfort, try cutting the dosage in half and seeing how you feel. If you continue to have a negative response, then we might wanna look at other strategies. Due to chronic inflammation, some people will need to start with soothing agents like L-glutamine or mucilaginous herbs. Others might need to target ways to support fat digestion using things like ox bile or lipases. And lastly, Probiotics and antimicrobial herbs can also be an effective way to support your digestion if you're not responding to apple cider vinegar. But again, as a general rule, for most people with Hashimoto's, apple cider vinegar can be an effective tool and one that is well tolerated. Speaking of good digestion, which definitely needs to be in place for our fourth recommendation, which is increasing your protein. I've said this before, but the protein demands for people with thyroid problems tends to be greater than the average person. This is likely due to a combination of decreased protein breakdown and absorption and an increased demand due to the requirements for healing. So instead of looking at the standard requirements for protein and thinking, yeah, I'm getting enough, think of yourself more like an athlete and aim to get proteins in similar quantities. My rule of thumb, make sure that you're getting at least 1.5 grams of protein, so this is a minimum, per kilogram of ideal body weight. So all you need to do to figure that out is take your ideal body weight in pounds, divide by 2.2, and that's your ideal body weight in kilograms, and multiply by 1.5. This is probably a lot more protein than you're eating right now, and in the beginning, it can feel like a lot. But if we wanna feel more stable and energetic throughout the day, have less hunger and cravings, and see improvements in our sleep consistency, then getting enough protein is a non-negotiable. I recommend getting your protein from whole food animal sources rather than shakes or bars due to the complement of other nutritional factors in meat and the stabilizing effect that it has on the system. 
Although these processed protein options can be an additional supplement to your diet, they aren't a replacement for the protein that we can get from food. Recommendation number five is support your electrolytes. Many people know that they need to hydrate, but hydration is not only just water intake, it includes electrolytes as well. When our body is more consistently stressed by something like autoimmunity, we're more likely to spill our electrolytes, leading to things like low blood pressure, brain fog, fatigue, headaches, decreased physical endurance, and muscle cramping. The best and easiest way to improve our electrolyte status is by focusing on increasing our sodium intake, but for some people with Hashimoto's, it can be inflammatory to the system. Usually adding potassium in addition to the sodium can help us offset that reaction, but you may need to play around with the levels to find out what works best for you. I recommend that my patients start with making a mixture that includes 32 ounces of water, a quarter to a half teaspoon of sodium, a quarter to a half teaspoon of potassium, and adding 100 to 200 milligrams of magnesium if needed. For those who really need it, the mixture won't taste too salty, but if it's a bit much for you, then I recommend adding a little bit of stevia and a quarter to a half of a squeezed lemon. This will add a bit of sweetness and make it easier for you to drink throughout the day. Due to your activity levels and stress levels, you might need to have multiple mixtures within a 24 hour period. So increase or decrease the amount based on demand and how your taste buds are responding. If things start to get a little too salty, then you can dial it back. But that's five down and only two to go, so thanks for hanging with me this far. But let me know in the comments if there's any of these that you really like and have used before, and let me know which one you're thinking about trying. But as we roll into our final two recommendations, these are focused more on our mindset rather than just the physical changes that we can make. And that's because getting our mind and our attitude is just as important as any other part of our Hashimoto's journey. Recommendation number six is to make sure that you have multiple goals as you'll likely have multiple symptoms. You probably know that due to the variability with autoimmunity, sometimes it can be hard to track what's getting better and what's getting worse. And I'll joke with my patients a lot of the times that it can feel like we're trying to herd a group of cats. That's why it's so important to have multiple goals because not everything will trend in a positive direction at the same time. If your only focus is to get your energy better and that is slow to respond, but you're ignoring the fact that your digestion is improving and you're having less bloating, your hair and nail health seems to be better than it has been in years, and that you've dropped a few pounds, then it's possible you could feel like you're failing. But just like with our assessment, it's so important that we keep the big picture in mind, so too do we need to keep the big picture in mind when it comes to our progress. So do your best to keep track of all areas of your health that you wanna see improved, and note and record that progress. If something continues to lag behind, then you can always make adjustments later. But often, if we could get most of our symptoms moving in the right direction, then even those that are slow to respond in the beginning will eventually catch up. And finally, strategy number seven is don't quit. Obviously, this is easier said than done, and some of you have been at it for a long time. Not everyone is going to be able to get back to 100% of what they used to be. But no matter the situation, you can improve. And if you haven't yet, it just means that you haven't been supported in the right way. Autoimmunity can affect every aspect of our physiology, and we have to approach things in an equally comprehensive manner. Hopefully today's tips will help you to start doing just that. If you have any questions about any of the strategies that we just discussed, make sure you leave them for me in the comments down below. If you enjoyed today's information, but are looking to work with a practitioner who has a more comprehensive understanding of Hashimoto's and are interested in working with me one-on-one, -on -one, then, no matter where you're located, if you're interested in getting that process started, send me an email at contact at seattlethyroidhelp.com. In the subject line, put free consultation, and once my staff receives it, they'll reach out to you and see if you qualify. I obviously can't work with everyone, and I'm looking to work with people who are highly motivated and want to approach their thyroid symptoms through natural means. If that sounds like a good fit to you, then I encourage you to take the next step. If you're not interested in the consultation at this time, then check out some of my free downloads in the description box below, which will help you to make some changes at home on your own. You can also watch this recent testimonial from my patient, Caitlin, who was diagnosed with Hashimoto's, but wasn't seeing any improvements with a standard medical approach. 
after we gave her a more thorough assessment and provided her with a specific individualized plan to address her nutrition, supplementation, and sleep, she started seeing improvements in her energy, in her endurance, in her gut health, and in her hormones. She's made some absolutely massive improvements and I'm really proud of her. But that's all for today. Thank you for watching. I hope that you enjoyed it. Please remember to like and subscribe if you haven't done so. And if you're looking for daily information, make sure to follow me on social media. My name is Dr. Brad Bodle. I hope that you guys have a great rest of your week and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.